I am going to get started so that we have more time for the other layer their talks. Um, I'm Xin Dong from Apple. I'm from the Foundation DB there. Uh, Neelam and I are going to talk about this awesome collaborated project between Apple and Snowflake uh, on the topic of native uh, consistent caching layer in Foundation DB. Let's get started with some motivation behind it. So Foundation, uh, just like other systems, Foundation DB can suffer from the red hot traffic. Uh, to understand that problem, let's imagine that we have this simple cluster. Uh, we have a bunch of start servers happily serving requests. And let's imagine that there comes a bunch of uh, clients who all are trying to access the same uh, small key range uh, that is hosted by this uh, start server team. And at the first, when the traffic is still moderate, uh, the load request can be load balanced between all the servers in that, in that team quite nicely. But as we increase the traffic, that set of servers will be eventually overloaded and finally saturated because of the uh, read hot shard. And a read hot shard can be particularly uh, problem problematic uh, in Foundation DB because a read hot start server not only slows down the read, it also slows down the writes. And eventually, it will affect the overall performance of, of the whole cluster. Um, and, because, and also due to the fact that uh, the read hot traffic tend to be temporary, and to help, uh, and, and at, the, at the point of the saturation, there is virtually no possible way to keep up with the traffic without uh, somehow we increase the replication number for that, for that piece of the data. Uh, then, like, th that's when the, 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 and because of the nature that uh, the read traffic tend to uh, temporary, we do not necessarily need a durable rep uh, replica for, the, for that piece of data, an uh, in-memory temporary uh, replicated data can, can help, and that's when the cache comes into play. Uh, now, let me hand, to, hand over to Neelam to talk more about that. Uh, thank you, Shen. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neelam from Snowflake, and we're excited to talk about the caching here today. Uh, so now that Shin has convinced you that we do need a caching solution for Foundation DB, I'm here to talk, walk you through some of the solutions. So before we actually talk about the native consistent caching within Foundation DB, you might ask, like, why not use an application-managed cache like uh, Memcached or a Redis, Redis Labs between application and the Foundation DB? Why not just use that instead of implementing caching within Foundation DB? So while that is a possible solution, it's not really a good one because the entire burden of managing that cache is actually on the application. And that's actually a very complex problem because the application needs to worry about the consistency and the coherency of that cache and availability and complexity in general becomes like really questionable. So even though it's a viable solution, it's not really a good one. With that, we will move on to what we are proposing and like that's a much better solution than just adding a, a side cache. So, which is to actually implement the caching functionality within Foundation DB. So, as we know that um, the reads are served from storage servers, so this cache will actually uh, sit in front of those, those storage servers. And uh, consistent caching actually attacks a problem from, from really two angles. One, it allows certain hotkey ranges to be held in memory, like Shin pointed out, and it also allows us to increase our application factor for those uh, read hot ranges. So, one, the, uh, allowing it to be held in memory, it basically takes, some, takes a load off of disks. So it makes, I mean, it also reduces the read latency. And second, the increasing the replication factor basically allows us to throw more CPUs at the problem. So the load can be basically managed by more CPUs. So both of these factors combined together also leads to low latency, which is also a good thing. So now since this cache is completely implemented within Foundation DB, it has the same consistency guarantees as the rest of the Foundation DB. So now let's look at how all this might look within Foundation DB, like, you know, via block diagrams. So we, we, have, a, we have the Foundation DB client uh, and the T logs. So the Foundation DB client will continue writing into the T logs. So, I mean, even though there, there is like caching layer somewhere within Foundation DB, the writes continue to go to the T logs. We ha I mean, like today we have the storage servers. But now, in addition to the storage servers, we, might, we will also have storage cache servers, which basically implement the caching functionality. And they both will now start pulling mutations from the T logs. So along with the storage servers, we have the storage cache servers pulling mutations from the T logs. And the FTP client can issue reads from both the uh, storage cache servers or the storage servers, depending on whether a key range is being cached or not. So just mind you, just reminding you that 
making, making it clear that it's all happening within Foundation DB with basically nothing visible to the outside application other than the benefits that it's going to see. So now, like from this, I would like to zoom in a little bit on two of the main components in the next couple of slides, which is the storage cache, cache servers, which are new, and the changes that uh, we need to make in the Foundation DB client. So first, the storage cache role. So we are bringing up a new uh, storage cache role, which is going to be stateless and ephemeral. So what it really means is that it's not going to remember any state persistently, and it's not going to durabilize any data. So if your storage cache server dies, it's going to come back as a brand new process. And in that process, it might even be responsible for a completely different key range. So it's completely ephemeral and stateless. So at a very high level, what, what is the storage server going to roll do? So it basically will establish a key range that it is responsible for. It will pull mutations from the T logs. It will fi filter out the irrelevant mutations, applies those mutations, and serve the get requests. So you might ask, but isn't it very similar to a storage server role? Actually, it is. That's exactly the case, but it is far simpler because we are not durabilizing any data, and that basically makes life a whole lot simpler. So now, without delving into too much detail, I would like to zoom in into the second piece, which is the foundation DB client side changes. So uh, we'll have the client API to configure the storage cache, which is basically you can add or remove a certain key ranges to the cache, and we'll have the ability to specify the replication factor. And in addition, um, there is, so the client basically caches certain metadata about storage servers today so that it knows which storage server to go to whenever a read query comes in. So now, with the addition of storage cache servers, it also is going to maintain metadata information about those cache servers, similar to the storage server, so that based on that metadata information, it can direct queries either to the storage servers or the cache servers. And now, as you can imagine, this metadata cache could be stale. So for instance, just, let's just assume that a new cache role has come up, and the proxy or the client doesn't even know about it. So it might just continue sending its cache requests to the storage servers. But in this case, with the addition of caches, the storage server is going to recognize that this key range is being cached. So it's going to serve the query, but let the client know that there is a cache you know, for this particular key range. So the client will then update this metadata cache, and then it will start sending those uh, queries for those key ranges to the cache server instead of the storage server. So this is like at a, at a very, very high level, the changes that are being made to the client side. So what are the implications of all this for the applications? Basically none. And that is the whole point of this project, that we do not want to burden the application. They should just be able to benefit from this without any um, serious consequences. The cache is being completely managed fun within Foundation DB, and it's going to be completely transparent, except, the except that it's going to have a mode to configure the cache, and it's going to see the added benefit for the reads. Now moving on to the last piece uh, for my part, which is uh, the cache configuration modes. So first we'll have the manual mode where we'll have where the application will have the option to define the key ranges that must be cached and a corresponding replication factor. And also in addition to the manual mode, we'll have an automatic mode where Foundation DB will detect the hot key ranges automatically and then it will start to cache them as well. So you might ask if we have the automatic detection and caching, why do we even care about the manual mode? So the manual mode actually gives us a lot of flexibility. For instance, there might be some key ranges that you just want low latency for. So they might not be hot key ranges to begin with. So if they are not hot, automatic detection is not going to detect those key ranges as being hot, and they are not going to be cached automatically. So we want to give applications an option uh, to be able to cache any key range they want manually as well. So that is what the manual mode um, gives us. So from this, I would like to hand over to Shreen to talk about the automatic detection and cache management and conclude our talk. Thank you. Thanks, Nina. <clears throat> so that, now that we, we learned how the cache works and how we can manually spin them up, let's talk about the automatic detection and the cache management. For this part, we're going to reuse um, some of the existing metric reporting framework in, in, a, in, a, in a cluster. And the ultimate goal of that uh, is to efficient, find an efficient way to marry uh, the candidate key range and available cache together. Uh, we can further divide that into two parts. The, the first part is the automatic detection, the second part is the, uh, the cache management. Uh, for the first part, um, right now, as I said, like each storage server already keeps some sampled statistics about all the requests it serves during that period of time. 
And whenever a server server finds uh, a shard becomes red hot, it'll notify a single intent process in the, in the cluster about that, uh, about this, and that cluster, uh, I mean, a uh, single intent process in the cluster, and that process will then con contact the storage server uh, to figure out in that read hot shard which key range has the highest rate density. Uh, so it will try to do the catch in a finer granularity than catching the whole shard. And then for the catch management, this same process will not only track all the storage servers, it also tracks all the catch rows in the cluster. Uh, for, for the resource consumption, and thus it all has the knowledge to know how to, uh, like when and where to put the uh, key range into catch and also manage the, the lifetime of the data in the catch. Now with all that, uh, we really believe that this feature will be one of the most, most exciting features in the upcoming releases of FoundationDB because it adds a whole new dim dimension to the product and thus will allow for new use cases. And thank you, that's it. Thank you.